Hey guys, it's Matthew Zachary, and I want to tell you about the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, or the NCCN. The NCCN creates the treatment guidelines for doctors that help cancer patients lead better lives. But I want you to know that the NCCN also has guidelines for you. The patient guidelines were funded by the NCCN Foundation and were created just for people with cancer and their caregivers. They're free, they're easy to understand, and they're available right now for you, the patient and the caregiver. So go check them out at nccn.org slash empower. That's nccn.org slash empower. Hey friends, welcome back to a special bonus episode of Out of Patience. I had the pleasure recently of attending the STAT Summit. STAT, S-T-A-T, is a really wonderful media group in healthcare. You should check them out at statnews.com. They have an annual conference. It was in Boston. I got to attend. And I was part of a panel called We the Patients with two extraordinary people who joined me today live in studio. Christy Cool is Global Managing Director of Health and Wellness at Xeno Group. And Peter Pitts is a former FDA associate commissioner and the president of the Center for Medicine in the Public Interest. I'm definitely the dumbest guy in the room for this show. So prepare yourself for a rabbit hole of information about jargon, people, patients, research, humanity, purpose, medicine, and all the fancy words that go on your fridge magnet bingo cards. Enjoy the show. Christy Cool, Peter Pitts, you're here. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Excited to have you here. I'm thrilled to be here. Off the heels of, uh, well, our first bromance, Peter. It was a bromance made in heaven. It really was. Christy, thanks for the for the Tinder date. Well, I knew you two would hit it off really well, and you're very different and also exactly the same. So I thought it would be a perfect combination. It really is like a Reese's peanut butter cup. Yes. <laughs> Are you the chocolate or the peanut butter? I can be both. <laughs> you can be both. Well, we're here to recap a fabulous event that we were all speaking at, the uh, 2022 STAT Summit. For the uninformed, Christy, what is STAT? STAT is a newsletter, a news site, and so much more. It focuses on the biopharma industry uh, as well as health very broadly. They have a lot of different verticals they're looking at from policy to tech to payers to medications to patients. And uh, they have created this incredible community as well. And so they have an annual summit where they bring together thought leaders in the space to talk about what's happening now, what's happening tomorrow, what's happening many years from now. And why was it important for us to be at STAT? Because so much of what is happening in our space right now is transformative. And that requires people really communicating well about what that means on an individual basis. You know, there's uh, something that actually the Walgreens people say that healthcare is is local and um, you need the scale of being quite broad, but healthcare really is a very local thing. And we are in positions, each of us, where we have influence over how companies communicate about diseases, about medications, and it was really important we bring that voice to the stat audience. Was there an overall theme this year? They didn't have what uh, I would call like a hashtag theme, but they were looking at things like the wonderkins, people who are really going to be transforming the space in the future, as well as talking to, you know, the the godfathers of our industry, like Ken Frazier. They talked with the women who saved the world, as they called the women at Pfizer and Moderna, who developed the COVID vaccines that we all so de- desperately needed. Um, they talked with people like us, who were talking about how we communicate with people living with conditions and disease. And they just spoke with companies, some that are very established, some that are up and coming, and had little what they call interstitials, uh, where they brought in people to talk for a few minutes about a hot topic. Right. Peter, you're probably too young to be called the godfather of your your skill sets, but why don't you let the, the listeners know a little bit about your backstory? I like that. I'm going to I'll have a t-shirt that says godfather of uh, regulatory health care. There you go. I'm a former, Gesundheit. I'm a former FDA associate commissioner, so I'm a former government official here to help. And I now run a think tank 
called the Center for Medicine and the Public Interest. So I have a chance to say what I think versus what the government uh, approves for me to say. Wait, th- those are different? Well, you know, sometimes when you're in government, you, you do good work and you work, work really hard for, you know, adequate pay. But you really have to stay within the lanes of what uh, the government wants you to say. And I found that very restrictive. And one of the great uh, freedoms about leaving government was really being able to say what I think personally needs to be said and say it loudly and in my own voice. Well, we've gotten to know each other pretty well in the past couple of weeks, and you have like 11 hills to die on. If you had to pick the top two, what would they be? Well, uh, I believe in health literacy. I think that you know we can talk, we can use big science words, and oftentimes they're appropriate. You want to be specific. But unless people understand what you're talking about, they are excluded from the conversation. So, you know, speaking in very uh, technical terms is often done on purpose, not to be specific, but to ice out those people who you really don't want to be part of the conversation, largely patients. Well, that was one hill. I think the second one is just <laughs> debunking all the crap we have to deal with. Well, you know, and the status quo. The status quo is a harsh mistress. And I think, you know, the, you know, the, the big hill is charging up a hill when the people's weapons are aimed at you from uh, adv- advantages of height. Uh, but it's a battle worth fighting. So, Chris, you put this uh, duo troop together with the three of us on stage, like our D'Artagnan and who was the other, <laughs> whatever the other musketeers were, a- Athos, Porthos, and D'Artagnan, right? I'm going to channel my high school <laughs> English class. What were you hoping to achieve with us talking about? Oh, by the way, the, the topic of our panel was called We the Patients. Yeah, I wanted to talk a lot about health literacy. We are in a strange time right now because you have some people who have lived experience with a disease who get either because they have no choice or, you know, are interested to get really, really deep and know so much about it. And at the other extreme, we have people who are vaccine deniers, people who are making stuff up and would much rather believe something they saw on some, you know, dark area of the internet, say on Twitter, than what they are reading in published data. So we have this dichotomy and often we try to do things, and I'm saying we being very kind to the industry, in a simple way. And so we'll say, well, you know what, if we have the the reading level at a low level, we're getting health literacy. That's that's what matters. Interestingly, that just in the last couple of days, a piece came out in um, JAMA. Uh, actually, I think it's JAMA, the, the open label one, wait, but wait, uh, open source. Acronym jargon. JAMA is? Well, that that is what they call the publication. Right. It's, a, it's for the Journal of the American Medical Association, yep. but they do call it JAMA. And people did a study of language. What are the things we're saying that resonate with people and what are confusing? Well, positive and negative. When someone has uh, cancer, a family member knows positive is not a good thing. That That's not a good thing. What they didn't know was if they hear the tumor is progressing. Is progressing good or bad? Does that mean it's growing and that's bad or progressing like it's progressing toward going away? What does that mean? And even little things like language that people are saying, don't take anything by mouth before the surgery. That was confusing to people. It was much better to just say, Don't eat or drink anything from this time to that time. So plain language is a big part of it, but we have to go way beyond just thinking about, is this at a fifth grade, you know, reading level or is this because health literacy goes way, way, way beyond, do I understand, can I read the words that are on the paper or did I hear what a person said to me? I mean, academia needs to be academia, and it has to speak its own language, but like can science speak person has been a theme I, I've been rallying against for many years. Before you react, Peter, I had someone on my show recently who had triple negative breast cancer, and her first response was, triple negative? That's amazing. <laughs> like, no, no, that's not amazing. Yeah. You know, there's a famous story about people going in to see their doctor about using insulin for diabetes, and doctors use oranges to show you how to inject because it's the same kind of uh, pressure. And the patient comes back in and their their insulin levels are just all over the map. And the doctor says, are you taking your insulin? And the patient says, sure. Every morning I get up, I inject into the orange, I eat the orange. I don't, I'm doing exactly what you told me. You know, there's a difference between being told what to do and understanding why you're supposed to do it. And that doesn't sound like a, a, a big deal. It kind of sounds like a rhetorical finesse. But uh, the health industry is really good at telling people what to do. Not so good about telling them why or listening. So, Christy, who's squaring that circle? 
Well, I think we have an obligation to do that, right? We can take that on. And I'm saying we because you are both brilliant thought leaders who know how to do the right thing and can bring in that outside perspective to pharmaceutical companies. And, you know, I work at Xeno Group. We're a communications uh, agency that works around the world. And most people working at pharma and biotech companies want to do the right thing. It's not that they are trying to do it. They went into this industry because they want to help people, uh, but they need outside help on how do we do it. And I think let's do it, right? I mean, Matt, you and I are both Gen X and we love, you know, music and we think about the Cracker uh, song where they talk about, you know, if you want to change the world, shut your mouth and start right now. So that is what we're doing. We're going to make changes for people. Yeah, Peter, you've been very vocal on, obviously, disinformation, but health literacy and disinformation, depending on your literacy level to start, can conflict. Well, you know, people don't know where to turn. And, you know, we, we, we make jokes and we can be snotty by people that say dumb things about vaccines, for example. But most people aren't trying to be willfully ignorant. This is simply what they're being told by people that they respect and trust. They don't know where to turn. So I think part of health literacy is pointing people in the right direction so they can hear the truth in terms that they can understand without belittling them, without making fun of them, by making them part of the solution rather than identifying them as outliers and part of the problem. I mean, the magic word here is trust. You know, I've spoken about this ad nauseum, which is that, you know, traditional communications and healthcare tries to speak to a, an average person. And there is no average person. Marketing and messaging is for like a patient that doesn't exist. You know, they're terrified. They're afraid. They have no trust. Why is an advertisement written by an attorney any helpful to them? So well said. You know, I often think about uh, my father-in-law was an engineer, really brilliant man. And uh, when my mother-in-law had breast cancer, the, someone was talking about clinical trials. And he had concerns because he said, there's no way we can have her go into a clinical trial because they're double blinded. You don't, nobody knows what's happening. What if she's in, what if she gets placebo and has no treatment? I can't have that for my wife. And we, you know, we had to say that that's actually not what happens in an oncology trial. It's versus the standard of care. Well, what does standard of care mean? What does this mean? And he's a brilliant man. It's not his level of expertise, and he's in an emotionally draining state. He's losing potentially, and and dreaming of that or you know nightmare of I've been married to this woman for fifty plus years. She's my best friend. We're not putting any more risk on her. And so we have to think about all of these people in the emotional state that they're in when they're receiving some information. Yeah. You know, also, people think about you – know, so one of the big issues about, about our panel as we were planning it is what to call it. And we couldn't even agree on what the word patient meant mm -hmm. because some people – a patient is a pot roast. It's an inanimate object on which you make changes and, and, you, and you flavor and you do things to make it wonderful. But patients aren't pot roasts. Every, every patient is different. Every patient is three-dimensional. Every patient has individual needs, even though they may have the same disease. So, you know, maybe patient isn't even the right word. Maybe the word is person, you know, or, or citizen. Uh, and, what about, and what about caregivers? And what about children who really can't uh, impact, uh, you know, what's going on around them? And then you have to ask yourself, what type of training do healthcare professionals get in terms of dealing with patients as individual human beings Precious little, you know, and that's really why it's called the practice of medicine. Theoretically, a healthcare provider who's been in practice longer should be better at this, and that's not always the case. So, you know, we need to think about this even as far back as medical school or pharmacy school or nursing school, you know, where when people are being trained to do their jobs to not just give tertiary notice to bedside manner. Well, you know, when you're a patient, you're kind of a product. You're there to be improved by a system that makes money improving you, hopefully. Improving you would be the hopeful part, making money not really the hopeful part. But this begets the question that we talked about on our panel about patient, person, and consumer. Christy, your thoughts? Yeah, I think we have to meet people where they are. And that is a little bit of a, a cop-out to say, because um, what the heck does that mean? Some of my colleagues in our strategy and planning group do very, very deep research every year. They call it the Human Project. We have data that will be coming out soon, but we look at what people value and getting into what is it that they think, how do they experience things, when are they receiving the information, when are they ready to look, and being there at, at 
each way. So even though I gave a little bit of a cop-out answer, it's because it's complicated. And I think that what we have to do is is talk to people in the way they want to be spoken to. I cannot tell you how many times it's driven me crazy personally when I've been with one of my children who was with a doctor they had a broken bone, they were sick, something. And the doctor is like, okay, mom, because I'm not their mother. That that just says to me, you don't know my name. And so it's shorthand and it's easy for you to, to say, okay, I'll just call you mom. A lot of other people think that's wonderful. They're relating to me because in that moment, they know the identity that I'm in is as a mother. And some people absolutely love that. So we do have to look at that. It's generational. It's the type of disease or condition you have. There's a huge difference between someone who is in a family that has a child with a rare disease and the knowledge, their expertise level, what they're going through versus someone who's dealing with high cholesterol. And so we've got to, we have to really dive very deep into knowing who who the person is and what motivates them. And also, you know, healthcare doesn't Healthcare information, health literacy doesn't come in a jar, you know, what, and the and the answer isn't simple. You know, part of the answer is we've got to do a better job educating the American public on health issues from grade school forward. You know, we're not, we're not going to solve it in 16 minutes. You know, there's basic knowledge that most Americans don't have that will make their understanding of healthcare a lot better, which will make them better patients, more compliant, possibly they'll even eat and exercise better. All these things come together, but if you just toss it away and say, don't worry, when you get sick, there's a pill for that. Don't worry about it. That does a tremendous disservice to moving this conversation ahead. Well, uh, let's take a quick break, and we'll be right back after these messages, not from the FDA. The COVID-19 pandemic showed us how a microscopic virus could upend our lives and how unprepared our society was for it. There's so much more out there that we need to understand, which is why I recommend subscribing to Crooked Media's America Dissected, hosted by former Detroit Health Commissioner, Dr. Abdul El Sayed. Each week, Dr. El Sayed sits down with doctors, scientists, culture makers, and policy leaders to ask questions like, how could new genetic discoveries change our relationship with our own genes? How could addiction to social media change our brains? Or how even climate change could make the next major pandemic more likely? To hear discussions on these topics and more, check out America Dissected from Crooked Media. New episodes drop every Tuesday. Listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. So let's talk about boogeyman language. You mentioned this before, you know, taking something orally or you know, injecting an orange. <laughs> or, but the word clinical trials are, are the scary syllables to the average human being. I once had to describe them in, in this way. And I used like a consumer metaphor that made a lot of sense to them. You know, if you're um, if you're not feeling well and they want to put you on a trial, it's the equivalent of you're either going to drive the same Mustang as everyone else, or you're going to drive the Mustang GT. And maybe you'll go faster in the GT. But either way, if you don't get the GT, you're still getting the Mustang and you get in the car and you're driving safely. And they're like, oh, I understand now. But I'm speaking like a regular person to someone that understands that it's the same car, just this one has a turbocharger. Is that a fair way to think about how we should be talking to people and lessen the boogeyman factor? Clinical trials are incredibly important. I mean, nothing happens when it comes to drug development really without clinical trials. But people don't know what it means. People think it means sometimes that it denies certain participants, you know, the opportunity to, you know, access a new medicine or technology. That's not true. And unfortunately, politics is, is interceding on that now because people are saying, well, we need health equity in clinical trials. But that's not what most, that, that, that means something from what most people think it means. Health equity doesn't mean that a clinical trial mirrors the U.S. population. It means that the clinical trial mirrors the ethnic and gender makeup of the disease state. 
And that's incredibly important. And I think if people recognize that this that clinical trials are not a politically correct PC debate among others, that it really is a human conversation. No one is going to say clinical trials are a bad thing. If they understand it, they're more likely to want to participate, to ask other people to participate. And that's as that's how you move these things forward by depoliticizing them, by taking the the, the scary science words away and explaining them in, in basic human terms. You know, one thing that I think is so important in what, what you're talking about is that we can learn a lot from our friends who are consumer marketers. They get to know what people need, what motivates them, how they want to respond, can talk to them playfully if it's appropriate, seriously if it's appropriate. And it, we're in a weird field because it is both such a hot innovation space, but it innovates very quickly, slowly. So, you know, Matt Herper wrote a piece recently called The Biotechnology Matt Century. Matt Herper, who is? He is a lead reporter at STAT. He wrote a piece that was examining are we as a society ready to move forward in a way that meet, meets the scientific innovation? Because we have gene therapies, we have CRISPR, we have all of these very technical and potentially scary things that are happening. But do we have the ability as a society to understand and to consent to participate in these things? So I think looking at the complexity, the fast innovation, but our slow change in the communication space and the marketing space needs to be addressed. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, why does it take so long for drugs to come to market? That's a great conversation. You know, how does gene editing work? That's a great conversation. But people say to me, what's the one thing we need to do to, to change in this country to really radically change our healthcare system? And I say, diet and exercise. And they go, no, really? I go, no, really? That's what it is. People, people are looking for a magic fix-all solution, and it, does, it doesn't exist. Until it does. <laughs> well, well you know, if you think about it, think about statins. Right. So for hundreds of years, you know, people had heart attacks and died because of high cholesterol. We identified it. We came up with statins. Uh, I believe statins should be in the water supply. You know, they're, they're incredibly inexpensive. They're almost entirely safe, and they're incredibly effective. Wow, what a public health victory. Do we talk about it? We don't. But the fact that we can now lower heart disease through a pill rather than having people eat better, it's a, it's a mixed blessing. Yeah, I, I hate the fact that, you know, that, uh, not to throw like Prilosec under the under the bus or anything, but those types of over-the-counters, the commercials are like, eat all the crap you want. We'll take care of your GERD. Like, that isn't helpful. No, no, it's not. And that, and that, but then that ties back to what Christy was saying. That's a question of health literacy. And, you know, we, uh, I'm, so I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a technical medical scientific field. You know, I can I can barely you know order a a, a Big Mac without using a, a fourteen syllable word. You know, we have to enlist the the knowledge and the talents of people in the consumer marketing area who really have have decades of research on this, who really have a much more intuitive feel for how people listen to what you're saying. And it's going to change over time because generations receive information differently. They have different values. And as someone goes from uh, joining a community they didn't want to join in the disease state to potentially be regaining full health or it might be something that's going to be a chronic condition, their needs and ideas about it will change throughout. And so we've got to be able to provide them the information they need when they want it and to make it really easy for them to participate in the discussion. Right. And part of the problem is we have these self-contained restraints. People in healthcare communications will say to people in consumer, oh, you can't do it that way. It's against the FDA's regulations. You wouldn't understand. And the truth is they will entirely understand. And sometimes the FDA is part of the problem. And sometimes the FDA is part of the solution. But we really all sit down at the same table to hash it out. I love the idea behind can we use consumer brand tactics to deal with healthcare communications? But I think the challenge is that, you know, consumer brand tactics are based on people getting things they want, buying things they're excited to own and have an experience. Healthcare is a, uh, you know, supply only. Let's just say that way. There's no demand. No one says, man, I can't wait to get cancer and listen to Matthew Zachary's podcast. So what is the reverse engineering? I mean, this is kind of like a maybe a, a gotcha question in that sense, but it, it intrigues me so much to wonder if it's possible to take the same kind of like, who are you as a person? What do you want? What's in your interest? You know, how do you speak? Who are your friends? Where do you consume content? 
And then where might you want to consume content you never hoped to have to consume? Well, you know, it's, let me kind of get, approach that question in a roundabout way. A lot of times people say, well, you know, we don't want to really educate the marketplace. We want to sell product. And that's allowing marketers who have a job and their job is to sell units as opposed to doing the right thing and being successful. You know, we, we, we've stepped away over the last 25 years from lots of corporate money being spent to educate American public on various disease states. And if you have a product that treats that disease state, you know, that's great. But, you know, do you, people say, well, I don't want to help anybody else. And that's contrary to uh, public spiritness and public health. You know, we, we have to help everybody do the right thing. So I think part of what we've learned we've forgotten, which is spending corporate marketing dollars against basic consumer education is highly efficient. I certainly respect that in general. I work in spaces where people did not want to be. You know, nobody is saying, I really hope, as you say, I really hope I get X disease, X condition. But we do have the ability to communicate them with them in a way that is not frivolous. So in consumer marketing, you're right. It's generally about what are the things we want. But, you know, I'm also a woman and it's not that fun for women to uh, have their period, but Tampax is doing a great job and many of the other brands as well. Not a know, sponsor, by the way. Not a sponsor uh, of of marketing to us, right? Because we have a need. And I think that there are ways that we can uh, communicate with people because they are there now. And so the, the it's not about the consumer marketing of saying, I want to make sure that you like Doritos or I want to make sure that you like, you know, these, and also not a sponsor, uh, that you like this candy. Oh, please, Doritos, something. please be a sponsor. <laughs> but But I think what we can learn from them is that there is a need and there's a desire to change that. So whether that is, you know, as we think about the innovation in the future, maybe um, – in the future, we're all going to be having our amyloid levels in our brains measured when we're once we hit, say, 35 or 40 and saying, oh, now I'm going to take this just as we find out what our cholesterol is and if we need a stat and we take a stat. And, and maybe that's going to change the trajectory for Alzheimer's disease. But right now, we don't do that. We have to communicate with people um, because they're caregivers, they're, you know, whatever, once they're part of it. And so we can without minimizing the fact that they didn't want to be there, we can communicate about what some of the solutions and partial solutions are. You know, are. one thing that makes that reminds me of something, a lot of times technology runs ahead of our ability as a society to use it. When it comes to things like Alzheimer's disease, obviously the, the, the treatment end is still a puzzle. A lot of people are working very hard on that. Without With little success, hopefully there's some light on the light at the end of the tunnel right now. But there are diagnostics. There are some gene tests that can say, Matt, you know, I know because of your gene test that you are predisposed to developing Alzheimer's disease. Doctors will say, well, I don't want to use that because I tell a patient that and there's nothing I can do about it. You know, we have to understand how to communicate and really utilize these technologies. And sometimes the news isn't good. But, you know, is, is knowing in advance that you can do certain things like crossword puzzles or, again, diet and exercise, those are proven techniques to d delay the onset or slow the development of, of Alzheimer's disease. These are tough, not only medical questions, but ethical questions as well that we are not prepared to deal with either on the patient level through health literacy or even on the health provider level. People just don't know what to do. Just because there's nothing the doctor can do about it, where is the civil liberty of that person knowing that information? And why is it determinant of that medical practitioner to make that decision? Well, these are very tough ethical questions that we are not discussing. Well, should we be, should we be discussing them? Well, it comes with some heavy thinking, right? There, it's it's much easier for us to make decisions in the short term, right? And not always thinking about the long term. That's why um, there's so much economic data about like if you want to save more money, do things where you set it and forget it, where you don't have to make uh, choices right now between two things. You know, it's easier if you say, okay, the next time I get a raise, X percent of that increase is going to go into savings because you can make better decisions about your future today than you can in that moment, right? I might say, I really want to be on an anti-inflammatory diet, but you know what? It's the Christmas season and there's going to be the uh, peppermint bark and I'm going to eat peppermint bark because it's delicious, right? So we, we, we have We can't those, be friends anymore. Oh, you don't like peppermint bark? No. Well, I think we can be better friends because if anyone gives it to you, you can just pass it to me. It's the perfect gift. Done. <laughs>
<laughs> the gift that keeps on giving. The perfect re-gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> there you go. But but I think the more we can help people make the right des- the decisions that I was going to say right decisions, but that's not truly the the the, the phrase. The decisions that are going to help them in the long run. That's a, that's better for all of us. You know the good the good news is things do change for the better. Fifty years ago, when a husband and wife went to the doctor and the wife had cancer, the doctor would tell the husband and not the wife. Fifty years ago, if you had cancer, the doctor oftentimes wouldn't even tell you what you had because it wouldn't help. It didn't help you, in the doctor's opinion. When the doctor, you know, years ago, if you asked the doctor for a, for a second opinion, the doctor would say, "Here's my opinion. Get another doctor." That's beginning to change. So we are, we are making progress, but we have to recognize that with all the tools we have now, progress can be radically accelerated. And that's just not just medical science, that's also in social science. I'm going to channel my inner mom is a film historian person right now. The movie Dark Victory with Betty Davis from the 1930s mirrored exactly what you just said. She has a, they don't really disclose what she has. You're alluded to like it's some kind of brain tumor. And the doctors just said, ah, she doesn't need to know. <laughs> That <laughs> she died. I mean, I'm not laughing because she died, but it's such an allegory of reality. While she smokes. Yeah. Well, think The thin about, one, the thin cigarettes. Think about HIV. You know, in the 80s, you developed AIDS. People whispered they didn't want to be near anybody. People were dying alone. It was horrible. And a community rose up and said, we demand innovation. We are not going to just die. They set a blueprint for many other disease state communities of people who said, I didn't, I don't want this. I don't want, but guess what? I really want to live. And, you know, I'm demanding that you involve us in the decisions. I'm demanding that you in uh, investigate why this is happening. I'm demanding that we innovate in this space so we can live. And now, you know, when you look about HIV status today, if you're HIV positive, and you take medications, it is, it is a chronic disease. Another great example is ALS, Lou, Lou Gehrig's disease. You know, a lot of times what the patient community is now saying to the FDA is, you view risk benefit in one way, we view it in another way. And our voice needs to count, not just because it's a, it's a sad story, but because it needs to take precedence over what you believe we want. We'll tell you what we're willing to accept. Thank you very much. You know, and that's such a great point because that comes down to health literacy, right? The the people who have ALS and people who uh, were dying of AIDS in the 80s, did they know everything about the science once it started? No. And they did go out and educate themselves, certainly. But what they did know was the status quo isn't okay. And I need more information and I need you, community, to change things for me so that I can continue to live. Yeah, you know, one of the uh, one of the great movers and shakers uh, in HIV research was Tony Fauci. People don't remember that. He's the guy that said we can run what's called parallel clinical trials. We can do a standard gold standard double blind placebo controlled experiment and we can also actually give drugs to people to see what happens. You know, so you know, it, it sometimes it's just the uh, the personal, you know, determination of of one person that can really change the uh, the course of a disease state. So wrapping up, by the way, you're both welcome back here anytime you want, because this is a fascinating conversation. I mean, listeners, my listeners, my amazing listeners come from all walks of life. They're patients, they're advocates, caregivers, activists, they come from industry, pharma, doctors. It's an amazing array of people who love to hear like nerdy, awesome stuff like what we're talking about here. If there's one or two things that people can take away from this conversation, what would those be? Christy? I think if you are living with a disease state, find out a family member has one to speak up, ask questions, because that kind of action helps us change the dynamic. Because then on our end of it, when we're trying to help pharma companies uh, say, this is how we can communicate or have helping a hospital system say, this is how we can communicate. There's the push pull. So number one, speak up. You, you, you are not someone who's just, it's happening to you, you are an active participant. Um, And since I've just put weight on people on the other side, those of us in the pharma space, let's make sure that we're not seeing lawyers as the enemy. And I'm not just saying that because I have a law degree. But let's keep in mind, their job is to assess risk. It's not to say yes or no. It is to say, this is the risk of doing X. And then we have to decide, is that a risk we're willing to take? Bingo. Peter? I think I'll go, I'll go back to health literacy. You know, unless people 
know what types of questions to ask, or even more basically, I guess, if people need to understand that it's okay to ask questions. If people use acronyms, which we do, we're in a very acronym-heavy business. If you don't know what the letters stand for, ask. You know, if a doctor is giving you information that uh, you don't like or you don't believe or you've heard different, engage in a debate, engage in a, in, a, in a conversation. In my opinion, a healthcare provider that doesn't want to discuss a patient's questions is not a physician or a nurse or a pharmacist that you want to be doing business with. So in conclusion, channel your chutzpah, people. Christy Kuhl is the Global Managing Director of Health and Wellness at Zeno Group. Did I get that right? You did. I'm reading off LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, you are many, many things. Um, president of the Center for Medicine and the Public Interest, former FDA commissioner, and my God, pop culture guy beyond measure. Uh, I, I don't like Doritos, but they're not a sponsor, so that's okay. Remember the crunch all you want, we'll make more. I do. So your Gen X reference of the day has been satisfied. Christy, Peter, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Out of Patience with Matthew Zachary is an Offscript Health production. The executive producers are Matthew Zachary and Andrew McDowell. It's mixed and edited by Kyle Moore. If you like the show, ratings and reviews are always welcome. Leave us a message anytime at 855-AUDIO-66. That's 855-AUDIO-66 to share your healthcare shitness with us. And we might just play them on the air on a future episode. For more information about this show and Offscript Health, visit offscript.com. That's offscript, no T, dot com. <laughs>